critical to sunshine kitchen moonshine. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. a new site for the uh, Teen Woman Brewers meeting. Oh, great! In March. Great. Um, well, Ranges programs. Good, good food. I really like it. Good food. Local food. Make that good show and stuff. I can highly recommend it. Is that the one on Mill Avenue? Oh yeah, on Mill. Volatile place. Yeah. 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 I went to lunch there a couple weeks ago. Kind of an eclectic. Well, it used to be the people who owned it used to own the eclectic cafe in downtown Brainerd, or, you know, right there um, in the corner. Yeah, in the corner or whatever. Um, That's not a good spot. It was, yeah, yeah. Oh no, no, you're thinking of the, the second one, which was on Washington, right? Yeah. I'm thinking it's before that they had one even, and it was downtown, closer to like uh, where the um, oh, like where the last turn was, it's kind of right there. I can't remember if it was down the next block or what it was, but it was right in that vicinity. And that was the first eclectic, and then that one shut down, oh, and then yeah. they reopened it on yeah. Washington. Right. And now it's the skillet, which yeah. that's good breakfast for two. It is. Yeah. Uh, didn't John pass some kind of a, a bill last session where they had money for businesses or something? Well, you know, he had, I think, some gap financing stuff. You know, right. I, I think he, he serves on the jobs committee, and so he's a little bit more familiar with some of that stuff than I am. But, right. you know, um, I did have the uh, one of the largest business tax cuts in uh, Minnesota history in the last bill here. was the unemployment insurance tax cut. Right. And um, so that's $346 million. Uh, We just actually, a couple weeks ago, I got a letter from a couple in Aiken who are obviously constituents of mine, but their daughter owns a business in Brooklyn Park. Um, and she was able to save $30,000 alone with that tax cut and uh, reinvested it in increased wages and benefits for employees, which it's like a double win for me. Yeah. You know? I mean, mm -hmm. so that was. So that's something that you did. Yeah, that was, I was a cheap author on that one. Did you get all that, John? We're <laughs> rolling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> you sound like a good yeah. job program to me. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, the job coalition is really I think so. Okay, this is the menu right here. We had a big crowd at the uh, at the museum. Yeah, the other Ryan exhibit. Oh, Tom Ryan, the lawyer. Yeah, that whole family. The yeah. Don Don Ryan. Don Ryan. Okay. Clem. And I don't know. It was a big family. Are they um, like longtime Brainerd people or what? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, uh, Four generations. Pardon? Four generations? Five. Five. Five generations. This piece of wow. great dispatch. Yeah. And they had a whole bunch of them up there. Uh, the current county attorney, Don Ryan, uh, got a hold of a lot of old stuff from the family, the lawyers. Oh, I saw that picture yeah. with all the old and, books uh, and stuff. built an exhibit on the top floor of our museum. It's very, turned out pretty nice. Um, Good piece of history. So we must have been well, one of the original families up here then. Yeah. yeah. Five generations of the girls. Ryan's and Rutgers. O'Brien's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it wasn't, I mean, that, I'm trying to figure out, you know, the, 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 the cabin out on, on that lake. I mean, that had to have been built back in the 30s. Oh, yeah. So they had well, their tennis court. They all had, they all had cabins. Out. Right. But I mean, because by the time, you know, in the early 60s, I mean, that tennis court was already, we yeah. were going to the middle of it, so that must have been back in the 80s, but oh, yeah. you know, I built back in the 20s, I'm guessing. It's kind of a big table, so I'm going to cut into the middle a little bit here. But, um, I'm thinking that, uh, seeing as how I know most of you and have had the opportunity to talk with you all about some stuff we've done, that, um, just wanted to see if uh, you had any questions or any specific things. I have two questions. Two questions, Jean. What's up? Uh, the first one has there been any talk of putting any solar panels on this new stadium that they're building? The thought came to me when there was some <laughs> news report some, that said something about all the financing and the infrastructure and the, and the energy use and and they said 
energy. I thought, that's a whole great big surface up there. They could put solar panels. On. You know, I don't know um, the latest on the architecture for the stadium, what the, the plan is. Uh, would, you know, I, I think it's, it's a roofless stadium, isn't it? So are they, it's not going to have a roof, I don't believe, is it? The Viking Stadium? Yeah. They're talking about the possibility of retracting the still. Yeah. Oh, but I said climate control was a word used. Huh. In and this that's case. why they could they could uh, put a bid in for the Super Bowl right. climate control. in February because it would have. Yeah, climate uh, control <laughs> was the key word in there. Could you imagine how oh, simple at 20 below? Like it's been well, we had one already. It was back in the 90s, early 90s. Yeah. Right? So but that was the bill. Yeah, right. indoors. Um, you know, I haven't heard anything about that. I, I, the legislation on the stadium has, has left our hands already, and so I don't know that we could, you know, obligate them to do that. But um, you know, some of the stuff we did this last year was that, uh, you know, with the energy bill, um, we had a, uh, a provision that uh, allotted for uh, Minnesota-made uh, solar manufacturers, so that um, industries across Minnesota, solar industries, could get uh, up and running and you know, increase their capacity. I just uh, actually, some of you might know uh, Karen Wilson and L.A. Slade. Um, they're friends of mine or whatever, and um, they had a friend at their house the other day when I stopped by that's interested in starting a, a solar manufacturing company here in Minnesota. And I guess there's some differentiation between you know, the high-grade stuff that's being put out you know, by um, you know, corporations or companies that have uh, you know, the cutting-edge technology and stuff like that, and then there's also like a secondary sort of residential-grade stuff that's being put out at a little bit lower cost. And, you know, I think one of the reasons that we wanted to have that provision in there was to make sure that you know, as, as uh, renewable energy resources become more widely used that uh, Minnesota manufacturers are involved in it and that we have the capacity here in our home state. I mean, I think those are the type of good jobs that, uh, you know, we want to see fifty, sixty thousand dollars on our manufacturing jobs and the cutting edge technology, so. Yeah. Well, since we do have some of those companies already in the state, if you know anybody that you can put in a good word with. Well. <laughs> there's, um, my understanding is the largest manufacturers, there's one uh, up on the range somewhere, like by Hibbing maybe, uh, and then there's another one uh, down in Bloomington. And I think the one in Bloomington is substantially larger than the one in Hibbing, or in the Hibbing area right now. <coughs> but, um, you know, obviously we'd like to see uh, things like that, so. Mm -hmm. Any, um, you know, obviously uh, I've had the opportunity to talk with most of you and you're following along the papers and stuff like that, but. Uh, at the last meeting, I was able to recap some of the things that we did during the last legislative session, uh, particularly things that I worked on. So I serve on the, the K-12 Finance Committee, as you're well aware. And, um, we're still very proud that we passed one of the largest K-12 bills in uh, many years, <coughs> $550 million in total investment. Uh, $40 million of that was uh, the first ever scholarships for early learners. And that was a bipartisan effort that was supported by the Chamber of Commerce and um, you know, groups from across Minnesota's coalition called Mini Minds. Um, and I think that what the, the basis is, and, and the, the business rationale for it, is that uh, we know that uh, according to studies that have been done on early learners uh, by Art Rolnick at the uh, Federal Reserve uh, in Minneapolis there, and uh, at other places across the country, that his study found there's a 16 to 1 return on your investment for every dollar spent on early childhood education, uh, particularly aimed at you know three and four year olds. Uh, other studies have shown more of a 10 to 1 investment uh, return, and so you know the, the truth is probably somewhere in between there, but. If you make sure the kids are ready for school, uh, it's going to increase the likelihood that they're ready to read in third grade, which is a key marker right now, we know, for predicted, uh, predictions of later in life success. Um, we, you know, we've seen, obviously, uh, the good that the, the program can do. And you know, when kids are literate and they're able to go through the rest of their school career, the, um, the likelihood that they can get into college or into a you know, high skill trade um, later in life is enhanced. And obviously, it cuts down on cost of assistance programs later on or in you know, the worst case uh, situations like uh, prison and whatnot, uh, recidivist kind of activity. So that was a, a big thing. We're all very proud of that. I think there's some discussion that we'll look to expand those scholarships maybe if we continue to have a $1.1 $1 .1 billion surplus, uh, which was the projection in, in November. Um, the February, February forecast will come out here um, you know, in the coming weeks and we'll know whether we're going to be working with a, a surplus of that size or somewhere relative to that. Um, the important thing that referenced the, the budget surplus is that in eight of the last 10 years, uh, we were able, uh, rather the, the legislature faced deficits and um, instead of responding with a mix of uh, cuts and in revenue increases, they solely responded with cuts, uh, with the exception perhaps of the, the cigarette tax increase. Um, 
And you know, in that time, especially in greater Minnesota here, uh, as it pertains to education, uh, schools across Minnesota have lost 12% to inflation, 12% to inflation. Um, and we know that you know, when the school's costs rise and you know, uh, gas for buses and you know, heating the school increases and the state aid doesn't keep up with it, that growing gap there has to be covered by someone. And so you might think that a cut to the state budget is a cut and that that program isn't there anymore or anything like that, but really what it is, is it's a cost shift. And so those legislatures have shifted the cost on local taxpayers. And uh, local taxpayers um, in areas like ours have been put on the line for levy referendums. Uh, and we know that one of the big problems with uh, a system that relies on levies is that because of the disparate tax bases across Minnesota, um, the capacity that a community has to levy is not equal. So if you're in the western suburbs, for instance, uh, where John went to school, uh, those districts are able to levy the maximum student levy for $1,600 per student for a cost of around $150 per $100,000 worth of house that they have. And that's a, this is a statistic I take to every meeting. If you were to take that same levy, that same $1,600 per student, and you wanted to pass it in Royalton, this is before we came into uh, power, we, we've uh, changed this a little bit, but before this legislative session, if you want to take that same levy to Royalton, Minnesota, it's going to cost you $515 per $100,000 worth of household to pass that. Wow. And so you have communities across Minnesota and rural Minnesota that have suffered from higher unemployment, uh, who you know have 60 to 70 percent of their students often on free or reduced lunch, like the communities in my area have. And you're asking those uh, those parents and those uh, community members out there who would like to see the success of their school to pay two or three times more than other areas of the state. And so a key component in the education formula is equalization. And equalization is a stream of money that's injected into the formula that recognizes the different tax bases across Minnesota um, and provides uh, state aid for those that, um, you know, districts like ours. And so this year we invested another $30 million in, um, in equalization, which was a measure that I championed in the House. A few of the other uh, bills I chief offered in the House include uh, uh, ones that would give uh, local school districts a $300 operating referendum. Um, that was heavily equalized by the state. What I mean by that is, so if you look at the Cross Barrington District, we had a voter approved rev lef uh, levy referendum of about $464. Uh, it was expiring this last year. The board was able to approve the first $300 of that levy with uh, the program that we had. And then they went out and asked the voters to approve the balance of what was the levy. So it's about $164 or so. But because of the equalization measures and because of the program with the first $300, um, they actually were able to have the same sustaining levy, but it cost the local property taxpayers less than it did under the old system. Mm -hmm. So that's a move in the right direction. I think if you look at uh, what's happened to school districts in the last 15 years uh, with the neglect we faced under the previous legislatures and uh, governors, that um, the, the gap has grown from the 5th percentile funding in schools to the 95th percentile. That gap uh, used to be 18 percent 15 years ago. Now it's uh, 32 to 33 percent, where it was previous to us coming into session. And so we were able to um, you know, sort of bend the curve. I think that one of the things that's most frustrating for me is that you've seen these, I've seen these problems and you've seen these problems in our community and um, that we can't rectify them in two years alone, people in these local communities. You guys have any other questions about education or anything like that? I, I, I don't want to you know, wrap up the town hall on the short side uh, if, if there's things to talk about, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Have you heard any word about any agricultural le legislation coming up this year? Um, you know, I don't serve on the agricultural committees. Um, I just read this morning that one in eight jobs in Minnesota is tied to agriculture, and so it's obviously a very important part of who we are as a state. It's a very important part of uh, this district, particularly in southern Crowley County and out in certain places in Aiken County as well. Um, you know, I, I was endorsed by the Farmers Union last time, the Farm Bureau uh, didn't endorse, and so I've been more than willing to listen to those groups and, and sort of seek guidance in, in terms of what they want. One thing um, that farmers in Aiken County have been advocating for that um, I'm interested in is le legislation, and I've been following. Um, my office mate, Roger Erickson, who represents like Baudette and you know, a lot of the area up there. Uh, northeastern Minnesota, uh, because of the number of wetlands we have, and because of uh, you know, the, the lakes and just sort of you know, general um, condition of uh, water in, in northeastern Minnesota, uh, we aren't in the same situation that southwestern Minnesota is when it comes to wetlands. And so, but we, we do have an issue when, like say for instance mining companies, um, if they want to displace uh, or mine somewhere and they're going to displace wetlands, they have to buy wetland credits. And 
the way the system works right now is that those credits have to be spent in a certain area. And if you look at Aiken County, um, we have like 90% of our resettlement wetlands there still. And so what happens or what's been happening is, is that um, they've been buying up prime you know, arable farmland, fillable farmland in Aiken County and converting it to wetlands. And obviously it's distressing to the farmers in the area um, because it isn't, Aiken isn't, you know, full of good farmland. It's a lot of it's swamps and stuff like that. But um, because of the way the system is right now, it, you know, it, it provides and incents that type of acquisition by the mining companies to offset their credits. Mm. And so we're trying to, right now my, um, my office mate's keenly interested in this and has been working with experts in Aiken and other places. Um, and we're trying to figure out a system that disperses these wetland credits where they're most needed across the state. You know, some of those counties down in southwestern Minnesota um, are at 10% of their pre-settlement wetlands or, or around there. But of course, those are the places where, you know, acreage is $10,000 an acre and, you know, corn's, uh, you know, keeping them uh, well fed down there. But, so that's kind of um, the scope of what I know about the, you know, agricultural proposals this year. And it's not strictly agricultural so much as it is a, an issue of the environment and resources. There used to be quite a lot of wild rice farming in Aiken County. Is it still going on, or are they losing it? <coughs> there still is a, um, and canoe is out there. Is it, what, what's the farm yeah. called? But that's the, you know, the can, canoe brand right. wild rice can. Yeah. Yeah. The can yeah. wild rice. Yep, that's made out of Aiken. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I had some friends that were from Aiken, and um, they knew the wild rice farmers, and so we'd get to go out there and shoot the blackbirds. You know, I mean, or, you know, so more, you know, we deterred them more than we actually killed them, but because when they came and landed on the rice kernels, they'd knock the rice into the water and then the rice would spoil. And so they, and you have to imagine, like, by the 100,000 they come in. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it was kind of a, an interesting yeah. thing to do back then. But, you know, so there's still a lot of that out there. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of uh, largely what we did. You know, obviously, as we look at the next uh, session here, we're, we're talking about uh, bonding. Uh, there are many important projects locally that will be in the bonding bill, uh, or that we're fighting to make sure stay in the bonding bill. The county fairgrounds as well. In Aiken, yeah, especially. Um, and what we're looking at there um, is uh, a food service bill. Uh, we, we're not going to be able to accommodate all the requests that Aiken, um, you know, the fairgrounds the committee has. But the, the, the primary one that they have is the food service building. And obviously we know that's very important to the local groups that use it as a fundraiser. Um, and so uh, I think it's about $325,000 that Aiken needs uh, in order to do it. And so we've been pushing, uh, as a, we had the bonding committee come through this summer to check out the fairgrounds. Uh, we also uh, were able to, uh, you know, have a meeting with uh, Alice Hausman, the chair of the bonding committee, uh, Jane Nash, the committee administrator down there. Uh, I just ran into Tiffany Gustin, who works at the Aiken School and is kind of, you know, uh, the head of that little committee in Aiken there to keep her updated on the progress. But we're going to continue to try and find some for that. Um, the, a, the, the Brainerd uh, Airport is a big project that's got bipartisan support. It's support within the business community, local cities um, also are supporting it. So uh, Senator Rude, Representative Ward, uh, and I, you know, obviously have been working closely to try and make sure that that stays in the governor's proposal. Um, but uh, that's kind of, you know, where those things are at right now. And they'll create a few jobs. And yeah, and one of the reasons the business community, like the Chamber and the Brainerd Lakes Area Economic Development Corporation, Bladeck, are really pushing for the water and sewer line to the airport is because uh, there's an existing corridor of businesses there, and they, they think they can see additional development if those businesses have the resources. Um, I think it's a good example of a wise investment by government that could spur job growth along that, uh, along that corridor. And, you know, I think the question would be is, if those businesses were left to uh, fend for themselves or had to finance that entirely, I think it would inhibit uh, job development. So government and business, I think, have to work hand in hand to see uh, development in that, in that regard. A good example, uh, Joe, is that Anderson Brothers out there on the highway have been trying to get that uh, through the city and so forth for a number of years. They want to be hooked up to city sewer and water. And also back there is it Acrotech or Atech, yeah. that old building there, right? Yeah. And so they've got a potential buyer, and I've heard this through you know some uh, members of the business community, the chamber and stuff, that there's a, some uh, buyers that have been looking at that building. But one of the things you know that's holding them back a little bit is that they like you know water and sewer obviously out there, but they don't want to finance the cost entirely by themselves. Yeah. Um, the other important thing too is there's an environmental aspect of the water and sewer lines there. 
So um, if you're familiar with the area, there's kind of a backwater to the Mississippi right there. It's called Rice Lake. And um, a lot of the homes that were constructed along Rice Lake have aging septic systems that they'd like to have eventually connected to uh, you know, a more reliable system so that they're not uh, polluting the Mississippi uh, lake waters there. And so you know, I think that if you look at uh, the business reasons, the environmental reasons, the, the reasons uh, you know, safety at the airport, which is the genesis of all the, the fire inspector came out there and said that because there isn't uh, enough pressure under the existing system to run all of the uh, fire, you know, sprinkler systems and whatnot, uh, that they have to do something about it. And the two options they have are to drill uh, septic and sewer on site, uh, but it would need to be replaced and it doesn't provide any of the other benefits that we'd see, whereas a, a pump and some, or a pipes and some lift stations would, you know, be a lasting infrastructure that would ben benefit everyone in the area. So that's a, a big project. You know, obviously there are um, some local trails projects. Um, I think the Veterans Trail down by uh, Camp Ripley is something that, uh, you know, has been discussed. That's not in my district, but I think it's got regional significance, and I'd be more than willing to, you know, um, see that succeed so that we could uh, have that type of asset in our community. Um, over at the Cayuna Lakes uh, Mountain Bike Trails and uh, Tar Trail there, they're working to connect the Tar Trail um, from Aiken, actually, all the way to Brainerd so they can get onto the um, Paul Bunyan Trail. And we've actually, mm -hmm. We've seen ridership uh, on the mountain bike trails, which are right there, uh, increase from 15,000 to about 30,000 a year now, which has been a huge boom to the community. Um, 30,000 people coming to the Cayuna? Throughout the summer, bike. yeah. Wow. You can go out there to the main parking lot by Pennington uh, in any given day during the summer, just about any time of day, and you'll find at least one or two license plates from other states. So, you know, I think that's another good example of, I mean, that type of investment couldn't have been made by the community alone, but when they're able to you know, take advantage of local funding as well as uh, bonding through the state. Uh, you know, it's a good, uh, it's, it's a good example of where, I mean, government can step in and, and provide the resources necessary to see the type of development that really benefits the business community in that uh, area. So that's a, a project that we'd like to see continued. Uh, we're, we're happy about that. Uh, the issue of the minimum wage, you know, has been one that uh, Minnesota has uh, been debating here over the last year. Uh, the House passed a wage at 950. The Senate passed a wage at 775. Um, the effective minimum wage right now for most businesses is 725 because they engage in interstate commerce when they use credit cards. Uh, the statutory minimum wage in Minnesota is six dollars and fifteen cents an hour, which is one of the lower in the nation. Um, I, you know, voted for 950 an hour. I think that it's important to keep in mind that if you're working full time at the minimum wage. Um, that, you know, sort of 40 hours a week for minimum wage. Right now you'd be making $15,000 a year. And when I think of issues like this, I tend to think of uh, people I know as examples of, you know, what this policy does. And, uh, one of my best friends, uh, one of the hardest working guys I know, works three jobs at barely above minimum wage, um, which we have to keep in mind if you raise it to 950, not only is it those people making 725, their impact, but it's everybody between 725 and 950. But, uh, so he's out there working three jobs. Um, you know, he hasn't seen his wages increase. Uh, in, in years, and um, you know, he's got to worry about health care for his family. He's got to worry about uh, the price of milk, the price of gas. I mean, heating fuel uh, <coughs> going up, and so I think we recognize that um, when you pay people a wage that uh, values the work that they do, and that they don't have to rely on assistance uh, in other government programs. That uh, I think that connecting the value of work and, and um, you know what you can achieve is an important idea. I mean, can you imagine though working? Full time and being one bill away from being wiped out. I mean, one car bill, one you know medical bill. Well, I'm not sure if raising even raising the minimum wage to 950 would you know it, it would certainly help. But if even at that, it still might not cut down on the number of people who have to use food banks to survive. Well, it it won't cut down significantly on it, and that's unfortunate. I mean, we and this is a debate um, at the Chamber of Commerce eggs and issues a few weeks ago. Uh, one of one of the legislators, the, the gentleman who represents East Coast Lake, said that if you believe in the free market, then you believe that the minimum wage ought to be zero. And um, you know, I tend to believe that if people, if you know, if the minimum wage were statutorily zero, you'd see people getting paid just above that. Um, and I think that minimum wage isn't just an economic argument; uh, it's much more than that. It's, a, it's about you know what our values are as a state. Now, I'd never argue that uh, the minimum wage is a living wage. That's I mean, we know it's not. Certainly, if you work full time on it, you still have to rely on assistance. But um, I do think that if you look at what's happened, everybody agrees. I think that the, the height of the middle class was safe from about 1945 to 1975, and um, 
what was you know good about it then is that there were a lot. I mean, you had people who you could have one working person in your family uh, and still afford the basic things. So things like childcare weren't as much of an issue back then because you had someone staying at home to keep, you know, to, to take care of the kids. Um, but a lot of the things I think that made a strong middle class at that point in time have been undone. And the minimum wage is an example of that. So if you looked at where it was in the 1960s and you track that to inflation, you know, right now it would be at 1075 or right about 1075 an hour. Uh, if you linked it to production, this is really, I think, the sort of tells a little bit more of the story, but if you linked it to production, um, by various measures of production, uh, which there's a precedent for that. So if you look at the graphs during the first part of the 20th century, uh, worker productivity was linked to uh, increased wages, you know, so the rising, um, uh, rising tide lifts all ships type of thing. But what happened is, in, in about 1980, they sort of decoupled, and the wages stayed stagnant while the productivity went up. Uh, American workers are more productive than they've ever been. This country is richer than it's ever been, but uh, wages, especially for those in the lower parts, have stayed the same. And one reason, uh, one example of that, and like I said, I like to think of examples, is if you go to a, uh, or a grocery store, it used to be that, and I kind of remember this when I was a kid, but you'd have one person checking you out, and then you'd have one person bagging your groceries, and that person bagging the groceries might even carry the groceries out to the car for you. <laughs> now, you know, or after that, it kind of became, so there's one person checking you out, and you're bagging your own groceries, and you take them off yourself. And then, you know, the next step from that is, now there are four self-checkout bays, and there's one person standing in the middle of them, sort of supervising you checking out your own groceries. And what's happened is, is that now you have one person doing the job of you know, six people, and the question is, why isn't that person you know, benefiting from the increased technology that's made each worker more productive? They're still getting paid essentially the same amount. And that's, I think, a question that you know, we need to ask ourselves. It doesn't do us any good, in my opinion, to have um, you know, a growing class of people who have to rely on government assistance in order to um, survive, basically. So, I don't know, you guys have any other questions? Or anything? When, back at the labor conference, which you visited, uh, we did a phone bank with uh, Tom Bach. We passed, the, we went from table to table, and I think there were about 40 calls within a half hour. Uh, as the Senate leader, mm -hmm. Senate Majority Leader, uh, he had been influential in bringing that lower amount to the Senate bill of 775. And of course, the Labor Council was very aware of this, and they, they wanted to get the message through to Tom. So on this Saturday morning, we were all dialing on our <laughs> on our uh, cell phones, and we had basically uh, a, a message to pass that House file number yeah. 92. Yeah, I, I remember the House file But what's interesting, and, and we took that, uh, that same uh, labor sheet to our caucuses, and I introduced, I, I cut the whereas down to four yeah. short ones, uh, the important ones. Uh, <coughs> but also, the bill is interesting because there is a training wage for people under 20 for 90 days, mm -hmm. and uh, the bill that you passed in the House was for 2013, 14, and 15, to step up to mm -hmm. the, the 950. And if you're a small business, fewer than 50 employees, it will be $9, I believe, ultimately, mm -hmm. instead, of, uh, instead of 950. And <coughs> as it's going right now in, uh, in 2014, it will be less than 950, and then in 2015, it will increase. So I included those steps of the current bill that uh, will be, I think you come back in February 25th. Yeah. So this will be one first, according to the, the uh, people on, on, the, on the Almanac show, uh, the legislative leaders want in the House and Senate want to get this done before the closing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <coughs> when it gets really busy, and that's when the bill died in conference committee last year, the idea is to get uh, the Senate on board with the House and, and get, because the governor will sign it as soon as you get it out of, yeah. out of the legislature. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are plenty of uh, resolutions that, that will uh, go to the uh, county conventions. Good. And, uh, it's well organized, we'll have a lot of support Good. Uh, back and forth. And it's, I think it's going to be pretty <coughs> bipartisan. Good. I think sometimes people forget that what you earn 
all your life affects your Social Security. Yeah. And if you're working at a minimum wage all your life, right. there is, I mean, your Social Security is $500 a month. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. That's a good point to make. Yeah. People so what happens is the elderly people wind up on other programs because you can't make it on the, the low-wage uh, Social Security. And people are laid off uh, later in their working careers that have to go back to these very <coughs> low wages right. are cutting in to what, what they're building up in Social Security. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, there's obviously an economic argument for um, for increasing the wage in that. Uh, people who work on the minimum wage spend, you know, the vast majority of their money. It all goes the back in the, economy, in the local economy, right? You know, it it's not go to some bank in Switzerland. It doesn't go to a bank in Switzerland. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't even get invested in, you know, some company that's building factories in China or Russia or in India. I mean, it gets spent at your local stations, you know, so in grocery stores and whatnot. Um, and that's why, you know, I think that it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's got overwhelming support, and uh, we just need to get it done here. Is the so. Chamber of Commerce behind it? Uh, I don't. I don't know. If, actually, you know, I don't know that because they have an official the position. To get the business, you know, somebody's got a couple of dollars to spend on extra groceries or lunch out. You know what I've noticed um, locally, especially, is that you know while the Chamber of Commerce has policies that they advocate at the state level, and some of them I agree with, and some of them I don't. Um, by and large, local Chamber of Commerce members, local business owners, uh, they understand. I think the relationship between the state and the, the you know, state aid that comes into local governments and how it impacts their property taxes, and they've seen their property taxes double in the last 10 years. Uh, they also understand what's happening to their schools. They also, um, you know, I think generally care uh, very much about the people in their community. And so um, even amongst the business community in this area, I think they're very rational people who I think can see the effective policies that we've had over the last 10 years. I certainly wouldn't say that they're all Democrats, but I wouldn't say that they're all Republicans either. I think there's a lot of uh, open-minded, you know, uh, business-minded but independent people who want to see, uh, you know, a reasonable uh, course chart forward here. So, anything else? I don't mean to keep you any longer. We don't have to. Don't have to keep idle here. You have another appointment. I, I've got uh, my next one, and then uh, I, in the meantime, I'm trying to get some stuff, run around, and do errands and stuff like that. I mean, I'm working full time right now, and I'm doing the campaign stuff and the representative stuff, so I feel like I'm working about 18 hours a day right now, and I have to grab my groceries when I'm running from one place to the other, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I, it's nice to see everybody, and uh, appreciate well, you guys coming out. Thank you for coming out. Maybe, will you guys be at the one to be held over more in your area in, in the coming weeks? Probably not. A week from now? Um, the March 1st is, uh, that's Aiken, Garrison, and a couple other ones I don't have with me. And then uh, the weekend before that, there's also four of them. We'll be at your birthday party. Oh, you. great. That'll be fun. Yeah. So one of the big things you know I want to mention, obviously, is this is, I think, probably town hall number 30-something for us. Um, so in the last year alone, we've been you know doing town halls in every small town in our district. Uh, and we've been really trying to you know, engage voters. and get Crosby out. City Hall is today, isn't it? Yep. No, it's at, uh, it's at Crosby Town Hall, but it's at the Hallett Community Center. Oh, oh no, I'm looking at Hallett. Yeah, Hallett, and then Emily. Yeah, Emily. And Jacobson. I was just out in Palisade at their uh, Midwinter Festival last week. Yeah. And of course, I saw you guys before that. Um, and it was a good good time out there. I had a lot of great conversations and talked well, about the, the library in Aiken, and that's going to be on March 1st. Okay. So we we'll look forward to seeing you there. I'm going to take a, the extra 15 minutes I get here to probably eat something today. So, <laughs> yeah. Good yeah. Good. Well, it's, thank you all for coming out. Don, thank you for coming out here. Nice to see you. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Nice to see you. Bert. I'll be sending you a copy of my column I'm talking about lead. Oh, you know what? I saw your resolution the other day. Uh, yes. Yeah. That was, that was before the column came on. In fact, it was Tuesday night. Cordy had already read the paper on Tuesday. You know, they distributed them Tuesday afternoon, yeah. and then we all read them on Wednesday. And, uh, I talked about mm -hmm. lead cuts and uh, cracking shells, and I talked about uh, James.